Hello and welcome to today's webinar. I appreciate you taking the time to join today. Uh, we're going to talk today about inspection for surface texture and lead in dynamic sealing systems and I hope you'll have a, a good experience listening to this topic and, and some of the insights that we can present today. Briefly, I'll introduce Bruker and the Bruker Nano Group. Um, I'll then spend some time talking about the different aspects of texture and metrology for surfaces that are used in dynamic sealing systems. And to do that, by way of doing that, I'll, I'll give an overview of uh, and an intro to 3D white light interferometry because that's the main technology that I'll be describing today uh, and a little bit of a brief introduction. And then at the end of the, the presentation, we'll have time for a summary and questions. Uh, before I go into the main parts of the presentation, including the, the beginning introduction, I'd like just to take a moment and ask you all to, um, when you have questions or if you have questions during the discussion, please type them into the questions box. And what I'll do is I'll spend time at the end of the presentation to answer the questions um, as clearly as I'm able. And if I'm not able to answer them directly during the, the presentation, um, you'll also see my, my contact details here and the charts are gonna be available for you to, to download if you'd like. And you can ask questions uh, as follow-up as well and I can try and answer them more completely later on. So that's the first piece of information. Uh, another piece of information for today's presentation is uh, I'll probably speak for around 30 to 35 minutes, uh, then have time for questions at the end. And after the presentation and questions are over, there will be a brief, uh, I think it's five questions, summary survey at the end of the presentation as you leave the, the webinar. So if you could, please take just 30 seconds to, to click through those questions and uh, provide your feedback, that would be very valuable for us as we try to create uh, useful and meaningful content for you during these webinars. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Bruker Nano Group uh, is a part of Bruker, which is a, an analytical instruments company um, serving many different industries uh, in academia, but also in industry. Um, there's material science and life science applications for the analytical instruments. Uh, micro microelectronics, uh, green technologies. We are involved in medical materials, pharmaceuticals, and a variety of other uh, in interesting areas in material science and, and petroleum, petrochemical, where people are using the instruments for research and development or uh, material identification, a wide range of, of applications. Uh, and Bruker is uh, headquartered in Billerica, Massachusetts. It's approximately 1.7 billion in revenues. About 80% of the, the business is global outside of the United States. And I am Matt Novak. I'm the director of applications here in uh, the tribology, stylus and optical metrology business within Bruker Nano. Been with Bruker about five years uh, doing this, this role and have a uh, good fortune and experience of meeting lots of very interesting challenges uh, for metrology and one of those that I'll speak about today uh, is the inspection of surfaces that are used in dynamic ceiling systems. So the next portion of the discussion I'm going to break into two sections where I'll, I'll give a very brief overview of some inspection in general and then talking about an introduction to white light interference uh, as a tool for measuring 3D heights uh, for surface texture or other features. Uh, and then the next portion of that, I'll, I'll speak about the application of that specific technology to measurements for ceiling surfaces in dynamic ceiling systems. So for people working in the areas of engineered surfaces, and what I mean by engineered surfaces means surfaces that are designed and built to perform a certain function as part of a greater system. Uh, they might uh, rub against another surface or create the contact points for, for a mechanical interface. 
there's a, a variety of ways that one can think of an engineered service, but oftentimes some something that's overlooked is the fact that there is a, a very wide range of spatial scale that applies when one is talking about an engineered surface. And what I've tried to do here is show that range of scales uh, all the way down from the nanometer level where scanning probe microscopes can, can help to inspect or determine the details of a surface all the way up to the meter and above um, level where fringe projection or laser scanning or some other kind of photogrammetric technique can give you information about the, the parts or the, the surfaces that you're building. Um, so on this end could be grain boundaries or, or parts of a, of a very small semiconductor surface or metal or a ceramic. And on this side could be, you could think of airplane fuselage or, or a building or, or other structures. And all the way in between, there are, are many other scales where um, the surfaces and also the geometry have um, either micron level or millimeter level or centimeter level features that need to be measured or, or checked in order to make sure that the engineered surfaces has the engineered surface has been built to the specifications required for its job. So one of the ways that you can get at that micron or even down into the nanometer scale uh, vertical resolution is by using what's called an interference-based optical profiler or a white light interferometer, a 3D interference microscope. These are all names that have been given to this kind of a technology. And I'm giving you a, a simple um, view of it in words here, and then I'll have some pictures that explain it a little bit better on the next chart. Um, but basically, this kind of a profiling system is a, is a microscope-based system, but with some special objectives that are used to create an image in addition to a height map at a local surface. So if you have a sample and you look at it with a, an ordinary uh, reflective or dark field, bright field microscope arrangement, you could have a cooler illumination and transmit through the sample and look at that from a traditional microscopy point of view. Um, to look at phase or you could put polarizers and, and look at the image in many different ways. Um, there you're generally just making a, a two-dimensional image of your sample. And what we do in this case of the 3D white light interference microscope is we add a special uh, microscope objective that's interferometric in nature. So we have uh, a, ref a reference mirror where we reflect some light back into the system as well as reflecting the light from the sample back into the system. And those two paths of light um, have the ability to interfere uh, constructively or destructively depending on the optical path from the sample to the beam splitter plane here that you see or the optical path over to the reference mirror and back. And depending on the difference in path taken by light going from different uh, heights on the sample relative to this reference, you're able to build up a height map in the computer. And that height map comes uh, at very high resolution, and that's the, the nice thing about using interferometry to do this kind of a measurement. Um, the resolution of height is independent of the magnification of the objective you use. It's dictated solely by the wavelength of the light and the coherence that you have making that interference build up. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is this interference signal functions as somewhat of a focus sensor as well, as a, a whole area in the field of view at one time. So you, there's no need to scan uh, the image of this spot on the surface in order to make a, a wide area image with height. The height scanning is only required when the sample has large topography variations, so tens or hundreds of microns or even a millimeter or more can be scanned vertically, but in each case, the field of view is captured all at once and gives you the height information in that field of view. So I said a lot of things, and I mentioned the, this, um, the next chart would be a little simpler to understand, and I think pictures are always uh, a lot more straightforward in terms of explaining a technique. And so this example is basically um, going to show you what I just explained 
uh, with a lot of words just in a, a simple picture and a video. This is the special microscope objective and it's looking down onto this step surface and over here you have a top-down view of the step surface and as I go ahead and advance you're going to see a scan of the this surface and the corresponding interference patterns showing up in the view and then those will then be processed in the computer to create a, a height map. So first the system back scans and then forward scans. You see the top surface and then the bottom surface are being illuminated. And then those special signals from the interference microscope are then used to calculate what the heights of the surface are. And this is done with resolutions on the order of a few nanometers, uh, independent of the magnification, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, scanning faster, you can give up some of that resolution and, and take it higher to on the order of 50 or even maybe perhaps 0.1 microns uh, in exchange for scanning much faster. This was scanned at a, a slow scan rate, just 5 microns per second uh, for this uh, small step example. But in general, if someone has a much larger step or a larger surface they want to scan, you can scan much more quickly and over a wider field of view get data more rapidly. There are various ways to show the images from this kind of a system. Um, traditionally they can be shown as a, a height map that is coded in color, a sort of color lookup table. So this example is a, a coupon with some corrosion pits on it and it's been stitched over uh, 10 millimeters by five, 5 or 4 millimeters wide area. Um, these blue pits are deep uh, impacts on the surface and the red areas are the higher areas. They're about a, um, uh, a range total of about 150 microns between the, the extents on this color coded map. You can also display the images in a grayscale to make them look similar to an SEM if one prefers. Additionally, people can use uh, 3D built up images with this kind of a technology to uh, get a nice through focus contrast on the, the surface to show scratches or, or pitting uh, and combine it with the information that one learns from this uh, overview of color map that I explained on the previous chart. Uh, here you see something like on, on the order of 50 or 60 microns range and this is, um, you can see sort of the, the scratch here and the, the indentation on the side is just here. Uh, but this sort of a, a grayscale or, or through focus image allows one to have a, a closer look at the, the scratches and details on the surface as well. So for the major portion of the discussion, now that I've given this introduction and overview of, of white light interference and this kind of 3D measurement, I'm going to talk about uh, an application in ceiling surface metrology and, and dynamic ceiling systems. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about what that is or what that means and then how surface inspection and metrology can be used to help sort through a, a little bit of a complex problem in such a, a case. So first I want to spend a little bit of time talking about a functional ceiling system. And what, what I mean by that is a, a ceiling system that might be present in an automobile or in an electric motor, uh, an engine, some sort of a, an aircraft engine. Anytime there's a moving shaft surface uh, that's either rotating or being moved uh, in a linear fashion, uh, and then a contacting radial seal, which is meant to keep lubricant on, on one side of the seal and air on the other or another uh, fluid on the other side. Um, and so these types of sealing systems are present all over in our lives today uh, in our heating and cooling systems, our automobiles, uh, transportation systems, etc. And they're a, a very complex system uh, when, they're, when one stops to think about it. There are many different engineering aspects that have to be considered. The, the seal and the shaft materials are, are inputs to this kind of a, of a system. 
the operating conditions have to be taken into consideration. Uh, if the seal is meant to function in an aircraft that's flying at um, 35,000 or 40,000 feet and, and the air temperature is minus 70 Fahrenheit, uh, the, con the constraints and requirements might be different from a seal that needs to function uh, here in Tucson in July when it's 110 degrees uh, in, in your car. So there are a wide range of inputs. Um, the different additives or lubricants that are used in the system, the assembly and alignment of the system matter, but then also the, the manufacturing process and surface finishing that are, are in the system make a difference as well. Many of these other things are, are controlled as well as they can be. Uh, in today's discussion, I'm going to spend time talking about um, what this part of the inputs does for dynamic sealing systems and how the 3D white light inspection that I've talked about can be useful for looking at the surface texture or finish there. So here are just some a few examples of 3D aerial images that are meant to show a difference between um, different methods of machining. Uh, this is a these are all 3D white light interference microscope images coded in the, the color-coded map where red is high and, and blue is low. And you can see um, there are a pretty wide range of, of influences on the surface from whether it be turning or, or milling, um, flat lapping or grinding. Uh, the, the spatial texture and, the, and the, the appearance of and nature of the surfaces are fundamentally changed by those machining uh, methods. And that's something, I just show this here as, a, as something to put in your mind as we go forward and discuss the, this, this case study that I'm going to talk about shortly that has specifically to do with some dynamic shaft seals uh, and the sealing system that were built using a specific kind of a sh uh, shaft sealing surface. Another thing that you can look at with this kind of a technology is looking at microstructural texture in addition to accentuating um, grooves. This is actually the groove of a, of a lip seal was worn into the journal surface. Uh, it's about four microns deep, but it's very easy to show this kind of a, a very high resolution image. And that's helpful to keep in mind as well as, as you're thinking of ways to learn or gain information and to also get quality data to enable you to um, inspect the surface and to gain quantitative information about the surface in both two or three dimensions. So the next part of the discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about a case study where um, there was a, a problem that was presented uh, to our group here in Bruker, both from a, an end user and also a supplier of some, some shaft surfaces. Uh, they did this independently. So the, the end user and the supplier got in contact with, with Bruker and were trying to understand um, some differences in performance. And this is a, it's not a trivial uh, problem to understand the differences in performance, especially, I'll explain more about this and, and you'll understand why this might have been complicated to understand what was happening. Um, but ultimately there were six shaft sealing systems and six sealing journal surfaces, the six shafts that are used in a dynamic application, an industrial application. Um, and two of the six systems failed in an initial functional test where there was a fixed temperature, pressure, uh, sealed fluid test, like all those different inputs that I explained come into a dynamic sealing system. And as far as the, the users could tell, everything was fixed. And the shafts, which were all nearly, well, from the metrology that was called out for them on, on the drawings and from geometrical standpoint, were identical. And we had four of these from a grinding process. We'll call it grinding process A. And four, two of them, sorry, from grinding process B. And the, it would have been great if the two that failed um, were these two over here in grinding process B. But unfortunately, two of them from grinding process A actually failed this initial functional test. And the, both the end user and the supplier 
um, had questions. Well, what, what's really happening here? Is it is it a problem with the shaft? Is it a problem with your seal testing? Is it a problem with the material of the seal, etc.? And so I was able to to have a chance to work with the the groups, uh, one of them directly and one of them indirectly through some other people in our organization to try and learn more and understand this problem. And I'm going to explain what we found out from this as, as we go forward. So remember the picture about all the different complex inputs. Um, and there are controls made in this dynamic sealing test for the operating condition. The seal and shaft materials are the same. The assembly alignment were done the same way. The lubricants and additives were the same. The only difference that we knew about was the two shafts finished with surfacing process B and four with process A. And then also, what is the resultant surface finish? And that's where I was able to employ the 3D white light interferometry technique, and we were able to use that to try and gain some insights into what was happening. So what makes for a, a good shaft texture preparation? There are some, many details about this. Um, I'm presenting some from Freudenberg's uh, NOK ceiling handbook. This is this RSS tech manual, um, and it's very important. Uh, I've, in discussions with other people in industry, uh, how important it is to, to try and balance the, the surface finish needs, um, the, how you actually do the installation of the, the seal on the shaft, um, what the tolerances are for the, the location of that seating of the seal, and also the shape and the form of the, of the part. Um, but basically, you want a very nice, clean burr and poor, scratch-free surface. Um, the surface roughness and both RZ and RPM, these are traditional two-dimensional stylus parameters that people uh, have used for many, many years. Um, the, the parameters have been around since the 30s and 40s looking at roughness with stylus instruments. Um, good topography and non-oriented lead, something that's recommended, so zero lead angle. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes and then good concentricity. So there are several things that play into what a good surface texture preparation is. And you can use the, you can definitely use the this type of a 3D microscope to give you um, both standard 2D texture analyses if you make the measurements in a, a proper way, as well as aerial measurements to 3D aerial measurements, which can be uh, reported against um, ISO standards uh, 25178 that are governing the reporting of the uh, different height, spatial, functional, and hybrid parameters for aerial data. We can also use and inspect the, the surfaces for micro lead, the shaft surfaces, and macro lead. Uh, and I'll tell a little bit more about these. So first, the one thing to keep in mind is you can compare 2D to 3D data. Um, you just have to make sure you keep in mind the differences in resolution. Um, this is a stylus trace along one line. It takes you know some time to get a, a few hundred points, depending on how you do it. You can get a lot more than this if you like, um, but this one was done at 40 micron resolution. Um, you can get a similar scan and show roughly the same uh, surf, average surface roughness can see where the surface changes uh, more dramatically on the three-dimensional data. And that's just meant to illustrate that similar information can be had from these types of measurement, and they can actually be matched up fairly well, provided the right filtering and, and proper sampling are taken into account. So here's an example of a, a 2D cross-section from some 3D white light data and looking at the RA, RP, and RZ values with respect to an, an independent industrial stylus measurement on the same part. And the, the values match very well, but you have to make sure you keep in mind the proper cutoffs and sampling in order to achieve that match. So the surfaces in um, this case study that I'm talking about were inspected for surface texture, namely roughness and also looking at um, some other 3D parameters. We also inspected them for surface lead angle, or twist, it's sometimes called in, in Europe. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now. There are a few different ways of thinking of this. Uh, 
the there's a terminology called macro lead or periodic lead, uh, and that is a fundamental techno technical way of looking at just what are the periodic or thread-like structures that are imparted onto a, a shaft surface, uh, the ceiling surface of a shaft, due to uh, maybe turning the surface and not finishing it properly, or if there are some marks in, in the grinding wheel that are the dressing marks that could uh, be transmitting a periodic structure onto the surface uh, versus the micro lead, which is uh, an aperiodic structure at smaller spatial scale or wider spatial scale, not necessarily in a preferred orientation, only in one period. And so those two things to keep in mind, there are a few different ways to measure these, uh, and white light interferometry happens to be able to measure both of them. Uh, which is a, a very unique uh, feature of this type of a system. Um, before I go forward, uh, I do want to say that um, the typical lead angle callouts for shafts, uh, mean, meaning zero lead, uh, were also applied to the drawings for these shafts that we're speaking about in this case study. And so, on this table, what I'm showing are the results of, for the four shafts from the first process in the case study, the, the lead angle, both macro lead, this is measured according to the Mercedes-Benz number 31007 standard. Um, it is a, an accepted standard and there's an accepted protocol for how you measure this macro lead. Um, and they all measured zero lead. Uh, like the manufacturers had expected them to. They also measured nearly zero or within a plus and minus 0 0.05 degree tolerance um, uh, on micro lead, which is an internal uh, developed method for measuring lead angle by our, our team here in Bruker uh, to be able to compare to something what is known as a string method. It's been around for a long time where uh, users will hang a cotton string with a, a 30 gram or so weight uh, and they'll use a vernier to track how far that weighted string moves on the shaft as it is turned at a prescribed speed. Uh, and so you can, by knowing the diameter of the, the diameter of the shaft and the speed at which you turned it, um, and by how far it moves, you can compute an angle, uh, an effective lead angle. There are some challenges with that method because the string spatially filters the, the details of the surface. And so we devised a way to measure that aperiodic microstructure uh, a little more carefully with the, the high resolution images from the interferometer. What you notice in that first set of four parts, uh, all macro lead zero, the second set of two parts from grinding process B, again, macro lead zero, uh, and then micro lead zero except one where you had a slightly higher uh, lead angle, uh, around 0.14 degrees. And the two that leaked are here in process A, which uh, according to the lead angle numbers would look quite good. So that meant that there were some other things that we would need to, to look at. So of course, you have to check and make sure that surface geometry is correct. So the, the size and shape of the shafts were all identical and with, you know, within tolerance on the drawings, and actually the tolerances were fairly tight. Um, additionally, the RZ and the, the surface roughness was within a 5% a or so or 10% range of, on all the parts and all within the specification as well. Um, so that type of an inspection and measurement also did not explain the difference um, fully from a functional standpoint. This is kind of the where the question comes. Well, if the, those things don't, what might we learn from some other uh, aspects of looking at the data and thinking about the information we have already, given this kind of uh, surface that we see? There's a unique texturing here that you can see, uh, some unique shapes. And so maybe some other information can be had by looking at three-dimensional parameters. So um, we did some time studying the, the S parameters, the functional S parameters. These are just some examples of uh, the surface roughness for a before and after, these aren't the, the actual case study shafts, but just showing you um, some examples of uh, an unworn versus a worn shaft 
Uh, here's a similar 300 nanometer surface roughness. Um, summit density, uh, looking at summit radii, uh, they change from on the unworn surface to being a little bit uh, broader to sometimes a little bit shallower, uh, steeper uh, radii for these types of summits as they are worn. This is information that you can gain from looking at the shafts. And in, in this case, um, these parameters all look very consistent across the shafts. But there was one parameter that looked quite different, and it happened to be skewness. Uh, and I think uh, skewness deserves a, a little bit of an explanation. It's basically a measure of how uh, predominant peaks are or valleys are relative to the, it's a, a, a third moment, if you will, kind of a, looking at a distribution. Um, how, how predominant are peaks versus valleys? And in this simple example, this would uh, be a uh, predominantly peaked kind of uh, skewness would be positive here. And when we looked at skewness for these shafts that were studied here, the process A shafts are shown left to right, so A1, 2, 3, 4, B1, and 2. And what I did, I, I had been studying at this time the functional parameters, and I also picked skewness uh, to put in this table, but showing how similar the functional parameters are for each of these but how skewness happens to change relatively dramatically. Uh, and these first two shafts that happen to leak have a, a fairly negative and large skewness relative to the other uh, shafts. Uh, note the process uh, A, 4, and B1 have positive skewness on the, the shafts, and even B2 has a slightly negative skewness. But that one didn't leak, so that's a question why, I wonder, did it not leak? And what I began thinking about is that is also the shaft that happened to have the largest micro lead. And it does bring some insight. If you have a, a possibility of leak that's being indicated by this larger negative skewness, which would allow fluid to flow under a sealing surface, perhaps uh, a reverse pumping can happen if you have a high enough lead angle to prevent a leaking. And maybe that also could have happened here if these had a higher lead, but we, we don't have further studies to, uh, for further samples to study, so it's not easy to say that for sure. But certainly um, having the ability to look at a wide area and explore these other types of information and data allowed us to have insight into the differences between those types of uh, shaft ceiling surfaces and to report this back to the people involved. So I think with that, I'm going to make a brief summary. It's about 36 minutes or so, 35 minutes. Uh, and I will go through and just explain. I, it was a pleasure to introduce uh, Bruker, the Bruker Nano Group, and the Tribology, Stylus, and Optical Metrology Group uh, business within Bruker Nano. I have um, talked a little bit about white light interference optical microscopes. I introduced them in the context of other inspections that are useful for dynamic ceiling systems and then showed how 3D white light uh, metrology was useful and, and ultimately helped to solve a problem where both um, a lot of different factors were working together f for users in industry to try and sort through a functional performance difference uh, and using that white light interferometry data to inspect for macro lead and micro lead, although those weren't alone able to explain performance, um, using the, this metrology to inspect over wide areas and to look at functional and also height-based uh, data parameters, and the interaction between these measured parameters, which led to some insights to the performance in the, that functional test. And I think that uh, demonstrates the, the capability and power of this type of a system for, for measurements. With that, I'd like to say thank you and uh, again remind you that I'm going to now spend the, the next portion of the time going through the questions, but if you didn't have questions or, or were ready to, to step away from the presentation, when you do, if you could please answer the survey questions when you leave, it would be very much appreciated 
and helps us to form and shape the, the content of these webinars as we go forward. And thank you. Now with that, I'm going to go ahead and look at the, the questions. Okay, I'm trying to make it bigger here, just one second. Okay. Okay, so someone asked, what is the typical FOV patch size? Um, so you can measure, um, there are a wide range of microscope objectives that are available on the systems. Um, typically for this kind of a measurement, for the, the lead measurements, um, you can look at a, a few millimeters, 2.5 by 1.8 or so millimeters on a side. Um, you may make that field of view correspondingly larger or smaller depending on the application. Um, if you if you have a wide area that you want to measure and the you want to do it at higher resolution, you can also choose um, to stitch images together in order to make um, make the the image have a wider view than just a single field of view patch as well. So I hope that answers that. I mean, the, there are a range of, of objectives available that can give you anywhere from uh, 6 by 5 millimeters uh, all the way down to very high magnification, which is just a, a 25 micron by 30 microns on a side. And you can use anything in between depending on the resolution that you need. Uh, someone asks, can the curves of a helical envelope gear form be filtered from the inspected surface? Now that's, um, so I have tried to do this kind of a filtering. Um, there are spline fits that we can apply to the data and also uh, there's an ISO standard uh, Gaussian regression, second order robust Gaussian regression filtering that can be applied to the data. But for these types of involute uh, forms, I've, I've had hit or miss results. Uh, I'll, I'll say it that way. You can do that in some ways. Sometimes the challenge is getting enough good data over the, the, surf, the whole surface of the gear with this type of a system. Uh, it's, uh, it takes some uh, proper setup and careful uh, aligning of the information. We, we actually have a different system which is meant to measure form and uh, surface texture which is more capable of handling those types of, of parts. Um, someone asks, uh, can I recommend a book or a paper that gives a basic background on white light interferometry? There are many different uh, sources for uh, this type of a, a background. There's optical shop testing, which has to do with interferometry. Uh, is an old-time book. Uh, there are lots of different papers that are published on um, uh, surface roughness measurement. Uh, and if someone uh, if wants to write an email to me, uh, I can certainly send you a more comprehensive list uh, of things. The, the technique has been around for a very long time. Interferometry is a, a few hundred years old or even more uh, technique if you think back in time. Uh, it's just been uh, the advent of computers and electronics that allow us to take advantage of it for inspection. Um, someone asks, uh, someone asks, how long does it take to measure micro and macro uh, lead? Uh, the typical measurement time, if you are doing it for the best quality data, can take about 25 minutes for making the several measurements uh, for macro lead. It's uh, 72 sites and they have to be a certain uh, length of uh, travel on the shaft surface. They have to be a few millimeters long, so you take a few patches and then rotate the shaft, take a few more patches, and you, you combine all those information together. Uh, and then the micro lead measurements, um, once you have a process, process that you're just monitoring for process control can be done a little bit in that same amount of time or a little bit more quickly uh, because you can um, take a few less measurements or you can scan a little bit more quickly. But on the order of 20 to 25 minutes is a reasonable estimate. Um, someone asked, 
what is the scan time for one patch of approximately five millimeter square? So uh, if the height variation in the in that five millimeters is small, say ten microns or so total, then it can be very fast, just um, uh, two seconds or, or, or less. Even you know if you go two seconds would be around the one x scan speed, and if you went uh, at our higher scan speeds, if you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of the vertical resolution, it could be done in just le less than a second. So um, the scan the scan time is dictated by the vertical travel that needs to be moved by the scanning motor. And so if you have a, vi a very long scan to, to travel for that area that you're trying to inspect, then it takes longer. If you have a, a smaller vertical height variation on the order of just tens of microns, then the scans can be done very quickly. Let's see. Someone asks if there is a, a good general way to down select for choosing surface texture parameters. Ah, this is a great question. Um, from the standpoint of, I like to think of it from the standpoint of if you know something about the surfaces you're looking at, um, a lot of times the, the, the surface texture parameters that you have access to with this kind of a measurement aren't even called out on a drawing or, or haven't been called out on a drawing. And so um, what I try to do is to start with what I know, maybe I look at the bearing curve or try to see if there's something that jumps out at, in terms of a difference between some of the samples uh, before I start trying to hone in on them. But what I always tell people here is that you, you also have the luxury of having, once you have the inspection done, the analysis is sort of done, you can do it for free. You have the data there and you can log to a database all these different parameters that you want to. Yes, there's some computational time cost involved, but if you're, you're trying to understand or study functional performance, ho hopefully that can be uh, afforded. You know, you can have the ability to log and track these different, um, log and track the different parameters, and then you can just start looking for correlations uh, or relationships between them. And it's a lot of times it's easier to do that pictorially with a, a graph or a bar chart, uh, so, sort of as I showed uh, in this case. Um, someone asked, would a coupon of a helical gear tooth need to be presented? Ah, okay, so yeah, so there, there are ways for helical gears, depending on the size, if you, you we could make replicas down inside there. Um, some, we have done some helical gears where they were smaller uh, and able to be able to, to look at them, uh, but, but I think in general the needs uh, of the measurement will depend on how large the, the gear is and how steep the surfaces are. Um, if the, the involute surfaces or the, the, the spline shape of the surfaces, if you will, it, are very steep or have uh, close angles of approach, then um, if you needed to get surface texture information, sometimes the only way to do that would be to either make a replica or to cut out a coupon. And no one really likes to do that, and I understand that. So it's, you know, we try to make it as, um, as, pos as much as possible, make it a, a, a way to make the part mountable and accessible, and we try to do that by providing longer working distance objectives uh, that can reach down into the, the areas that are needed for inspection. I'm trying to think, see other... Someone asked about changes, um, if someone change, changes in the measurement, um, if, there are, if you're making replicas. So that, now that's a, definitely a question that I would like to, to address separately because without having a better understanding of what's being asked, I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to comment on it. Um, but I would be happy to take a discussion offline uh, or uh, via email and try to answer the question more thoroughly for sure. This is a question about um, if you make a replica, why does the why are the results different from the system measuring directly, I guess, is what's being asked there. But I'd like to understand more about that before I try and answer further. 
And I think uh, with that, that is the last of the questions. Uh, again, I really appreciate everyone's time for uh, spending the time on the webinar today. If you have further follow-up questions, the, the information in the PowerPoint slides will be available for download. My email is attached there and you're always able to, to write to me and I'll answer any questions you might have as well as I can. Thank you for your time today.